Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church presents Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 2, Sunday, September 8th, 2019. The lesson is entitled, The Birth of Moses. Lesson text comes from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Related scriptures are Exodus 6, 16 through 20, Acts 7, 20 through 22, and Hebrews 11, 23. Place is Egypt. The time is 1525 BC. The Pharaoh of Egypt was the most powerful ruler in the known world of Moses' day. But despite bringing all his power to bear to keep God's people under his domination, God merely used his efforts to ensure that Moses would survive and obtain the necessary skills and education to become the one who would deliver God's people from Egyptian oppression. Today's aim, facts. To see that God used Pharaoh's cruel plan for the Hebrew children to raise up Moses to deliver his people from Egyptian slavery. Principle, to realize that all human attempts to oppose God will actually serve only to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Application, to remember that no one, that no matter how strong any opposition to God appears, he will always use it to accomplish his purposes. We can be encouraged to resist the temptation to despair when things appear dark and hopeless because our God is the one who brings hope out of hopelessness and creates the most brilliant light out of the deepest darkness. John 1, 5. Illustrating the lesson. The illustration shows how God sovereignly overrules the wicked plans for earthly rulers. Practical points. One, God's plan for our lives begins before we are born. Exodus 2, 1 through 2. Two, godly mothers tend to make wise decisions that protect their children, verse 3. Three, God will show us how to do what is necessary when we choose to obey him, verses 3 through 4. Four, God provides safety even in the middle of danger. Five, we need not fear because even unbelievers act according to God's sovereign will, verses 5 through 9. Six, God can use the resources of your enemy to strengthen you to fight against them. Verse 10, golden text. The child grew and some, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Exodus 2, 10. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is the birth of Moses, coming from Exodus 2, 1 through 2. The second is the preservation of Moses, Exodus 2, 3 through 10. Introduction. Providence is not a word many people today ever hear. Historical documents, however, reveal that it was much more commonly used and understood a couple of centuries ago. The last line of America's Declaration of Independence of 1776 speaks of the signers' firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. The word appears only once in the King James Bible, Acts 24, 2, where it refers to a person's foresight. However, the word represents a theological concept related to God that is found throughout the Bible. Simply put, providence is God's continuing work in controlling all things to bring about the fulfillment of his plan. God's providence entails the use of natural events and processes, as well as people and the decisions they make, to bring about his desires. Providence is as much God's work as are miracles. Both highlight the undeniable revelation of God's power. Moses and the nation of Israel would witness a number of miracles, but the birth and preservation of Moses are testimonies to the providential work of God in preparing the way for Israel's deliverance. The birth of Moses, Exodus 2, 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi, verse 2. And the woman conceived and bare a son, 
And when she saw him that he was a godly child, she hid him three months. The deliverance from Egyptian bondage is, of course, central to the book of Exodus. But God had to provide a unique individual to lead a great but often uncooperative nation forth from Egypt. The task would take a humble, godly, well-prepared person. In God's providence, he produced just such a man. But for those individuals he chose to use in this plan, it did not come without challenges along the way. The work of providing and preparing Israel's deliverer began with the parents. The birth and early life of Moses clearly, clearly fell within the period of the Edom just described in Exodus 1.22. The Pharaoh's law had been issued calling for the murder of Israel's male, child, male infants. In this context, we are told of a man and his wife, both of whom were from the tribe of Levi. Only later do we learn their names, Amran and Jochebed, 6.20. Hebrews 11.23 speaks of the godly faith of these two. In time, the woman conceived and, bo and bore a son. This was the child who would be named Moses. A little further study in Exodus reveals that Moses actually had two older siblings, his sister Miriam, Exodus 2, 4 and 15, 20, and his brother Aaron, 4, 14 and 7, 7. The translation of Exodus 2, 2 can be confusing. A boy child was under threat of death if discovered, and it might appear that Moses' mother decided to protect him only because he was a godly or beautiful child. It is fair to say that every child is beautiful in the eyes of his or her mother and that Jochebed was not unique in desiring to keep her son alive. Some have suggested there was something unique about the child that gave the parents even greater urgency to protect him. However, the idiom used here has the idea of longing or attraction, being fond of or wanting to keep. So it could simply be translated, longing to have, keep him. She, she hid him for three months. Hebrews 11.23 again clarifies that both parents were involved in protecting the child. Like the midwives, Exodus 1.17, they feared the heavenly king more than they feared the wrath of Egypt's king. They hid their son for three months so that he would not be discovered and killed. The preservation of Moses, verse 3. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink, verse 4. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Verse 6. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Verse 7. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Verse 8. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Verse 9. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Thorough careful planning. Through careful planning, Exodus 2, 3 through 4. The parents seemed to realize that at three months of age, their son could not continue to be effectively hidden. We do not know exactly what was going on at the time or to what extent the king's edict was, was followed. But apparently the danger to a male child became avo unavoidable at this point. 
the parents must have given a great deal of thoughtful prayer to their next step and came up with a plan they thought would give their son the best chance to survive. Jacobed placed him in an ark of bulrushes, bull verse 3. This ark was a small basket-like vessel that harkens back to the needed asylum provided by the ark of Noah. This ark was made of woven bulrushes or papyrus reeds, which were plentiful along the Nile shoreline. Moses' mother sealed the ark with slime and pitch, verse 3. Both, ter both terms refer to bitum, asphalt, or tar of some type. This would waterproof the basket. The mother placed her son in the ark and put it in the flags by the river's brink. The flags were the papyrus reeds that grew in the water along the river's edge. Some have surmised, some have surmised that this was simply a hiding place where the child's cries would be covered by the sounds of nature along the river and the mother could come daily and secretly care for him. However, in light of the child's sister being deployed to watch from a distance to see what would be done to him, verse 4, it is very likely the parents had something else in mind. Their plan to save their son was based on what they knew and had observed, but ultimately they had to leave his future to the merciful providence of God. God was already moving events to secure the protection of Israel's deliverer. Moses' sister Miriam simply needed to watch to see what would happen. In God's providence, the deliverer would be delivered by means of the ark, just as Noah and his family were delivered from God's judgment by means of a very different ark. Through a compassionate person, Exodus 2, 5-6, through 6, the ark containing the child was eventually discovered. But thankfully, not by those who were looking for Hebrew children to cast into the Nile. Rather, it came to the attention of the daughter of Pharaoh and her attendants when she came down to the river to wash herself. It is not likely she was bathing, but rather ceremonially washing in the Nile. The waters of the Nile were regarded as sacred, and such washing was more of an ambulation with which, with its supposed health-giving and fractifying effects. Did Jacobed place the ark in this location for the very purpose of having someone, and perhaps the daughter of Pharaoh in particular, find their son along the river's edge? This may well have been the mother's plan, but whether it was or not, God saw to it that the basket floating among the reeds was spotted by just the right person. Upon spotting the ark, the Egyptian princess had her attendants bring it to her. When she opened it, she found the baby crying and was moved with compassion. Although she immediately recognized the child as a Hebrew, this woman did not share her father's cruel hatred of the Israelites, and especially not of a hopeless infant. Through abundant provision, Exodus 2, 7 through 9, it is probably the Pharaoh at this time was Thatmus first, 1528-1508 BC. If so, this daughter must have been Hatshepsut, who later assumed power in Egypt and reigned as queen. As the daughter of Pharaoh Thotmos I, she was one person who could effectively defy the king's order or at least secretly get around it. This was, on her mind, seemed to be clear even to Miriam, who was watching from a distance. Miriam quickly appeared and offered to call a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for her. Miriam did not identify herself as the child's sister, but it is likely Pharaoh's daughter quickly caught on to what was happening, especially when the girl so readily offered a solution to her dilemma. In her compassion, the princess had already determined to protect the infant in the ark. However, he was not yet weaned and it was highly unlikely she could find an Egyptian woman willing to take and nurse the child. If she had even thought that far ahead at this point. So she immediately told Miriam to go and bring a nurse 
from among the Israelites. Miriam, of course, brought her the child's mother, verse 8. Again, Pharaoh's daughter probably realized this was the baby's mother, even if this was, even if this fact was not stated. The princess told Jacobed to take the child and nurse him. Unstated here, though undoubtedly discussed by the women, were the details. Presumably, the child would remain with his mother until he was weaned, and then he would be returned to the daughter of Pharaoh. Thus, it could be several years before Jacobed delivered him to the princess. It would have been at least two to three years, though. Perhaps she kept him a little longer, bringing him frequently to the princess, who must not be allowed to forget him, while at the same time cultivating in his young heart a love and loyalty to the race from which he sprang. Moses must have had at least some continuing contact with his birth parents beyond three years of age, for as an adult he clearly understood his heritage and identified with the Hebrew people, not the Egyptians. It does, Exodus 2, 11 through 12, Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. Not only did Jacobed get to care for her son in the early years of his life, but in God's providence, she was even paid for doing so. She took the child and nursed it, Exodus 2, 9, on behalf of Pharaoh's daughter, who paid her wages for this service. With the trauma Moses' parents endured, it is easy to overlook what the Pharaoh's daughter did. By taking in the Hebrew child, she was setting herself against the policy of her father. And with multiple attendants present, word of what she had done could have easily gotten out. In addition, we should not forget that it was likely difficult for her to give up to the Hebrew woman the child she had just claimed as her own. One writer noted that she is willing to surrender the child, at least until weaning, says something profound about her respect for the honesty and integrity of these Hebrews. After all, Jacobed can go underground with her baby, and the princess may never see him or her again. Unknown to the princess, the family of Moses had certainly considered all their options and had ruled out the feasibility of going underground. In fact, taking the child back to nurse him still would have left him in danger unless some appropriate measures were taken. We can assume then that the princess provided some sort of protection for the child, Moses, during this time. Through gracious adoption, Exodus 2.10. If we think it was difficult for Pharaoh's daughter to give up the baby for a few years, it is hard to imagine how emotionally wrenching it was for Amran and Jacobed to give up their young son to be raised by Egyptians. They had seen God work in wondrous ways to protect him, however, and they could safely entrust him to the Lord to direct his paths even now. Jacobed brought her son to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. This apparently indicates a formal adoption, giving him all the privileges of being a member of the royal Egyptian family. Interestingly, Hebrews 11.24 tells us Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This, however, points to a decision later in his life to place concern for his own people above a career in Egypt. The name Moses appears for the first time in Exodus 2.10. There are at least two questions regarding this name that are much debated among scholars. First, in Moses, first, is Moses a Hebrew name or an Egyptian name? Second, how does the name fit with the fact that he was drawn out of the water? Since the Egyptian princess gave him the name, it is most likely of Egyptian origin. However, some scholars argue that the explanation for the name makes more sense if it is Hebrew, since the Hebrew meaning is drawing out, and the Egyptian meaning is to bear or to give birth to. Gleason Archer, on the other hand, argues that the Egyptian meaning is son of water. It is a complicated issue, but it is clear the princess connected the name to the fact that he had been drawn out of the water. By Pharaoh's command, this child was to be cast in the river. By the providence of God, Pharaoh's daughter took him out of the river. The one who would be used to deliver Israel was himself delivered by the working of God. 
Interestingly, God is not mentioned in this verse, in the first 10 verses of Exodus. Yet, his providential work in these events is undeniable. Moses' parents did what they could to protect him. But once they reached the limit of what they could do, God stepped in and moved people and events to preserve the chosen deliverer of Israel. The princess was probably the only Egyptian who could dare flout Pharaoh's edict. She was compassionate toward the child Moses and able to protect and provide for him. This was the person God brought to the river that day. God's presence is not always evident. We might not perceive what he is doing or even understand it if we do. But of this we can be certain. God is present and he is always at work in this world and in our lives for our good and his glory. Questions. 1. In what context was Moses born? 2. What do we know about Moses' family? 3. For how long were Moses' parents able to hide him? 4. What was the parents' plan for saving their son? 5. Were they hoping the baby would be found? Explain. 6. Who found the baby Moses and how did this person respond? 7. What did Miriam offer to do for the person who found her brother? 8. What role did Pharaoh's daughter give to Jacobed? How long did this continue? 9. What reason did the princess give for naming her adopted son Moses? 10. In what ways do we see God working providentially in the events surrounding Moses' birth and infancy? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 8th, 2019. Thank you for listening. God bless.